Amen. I'm sure you're all familiar with the echo chamber, and if you're not, it's probably because you're in one. We're all in one. These days, the echo chamber allows us to pick sides and stay there. I don't have to worry about people who disagree with me, because if they disagree with me, I just unfriend them. I unlist them. I change channels. I, I aim for the station that, that supports my view, and therefore all of the news tends, all of my fears are being highlighted, and all of my desires are coming true, and all of my prejudices are being shown, and, and it's so easy to pick sides. See, Christianity is a wonderfully malleable and, and adaptable faith. Christianity is different in the Orient than in the Middle East, than in, in other nations. And in the United States, we have our own unique breed because, after all, we can all unite in the Lordship of Jesus Christ and yet be very different. We can unite under the Lordship of Jesus Christ and yet be very American, which is what we are. And in America, we are a democracy. And in a democracy, we have the right to be heard, we have the right to express our opinions, and we tend to pick sides. And as we develop our echo chamber and listen to the news we want to hear and friend to the people we want to friend and follow the speakers we want to follow, it becomes black and white. It becomes either us or them. It becomes either here or there. You're either for us or against us. No, way. you're either for me or against me. You're either on my side or you're not. And since, of course, I am a good Christian who will do the right thing, I certainly feel that my side is the right side. And it's very interesting that sincere Christian sisters and brothers who are sitting on the other side of the fence feel the same way. That can't be true. God help us. That should, that's not how it should be in the church. That's not how it should be among Christians, among churches, or between the churches. That's not how this should be. God made us to be one family with one goal, to share the love of our one Lord, the forgiveness of our one God, to welcome all of humans into that one family, into the kingdom of God. That's how it should be among us. The church of Corinth had various difficulties about factions. There were those that, that, that followed Apollos or Paul or Jesus, or there were Jews and non-Jews. There were slaves and free. There were rich and poor. And they all tended to see the differences and talk us and them, and they would all take their votes, and they would, they would set their schedules, and they would uh, grow apart when Paul needed them to grow together to the glory of God. Our scripture is 1 Corinthians 12. I've narrowed it to 4 through 7. Let's hear the word of the Lord. The scripture is in the front of your bulletin. And 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 7 is short but very meaningful. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Let us hear and understand these words that Paul has shared. Our bug men must be doing a good job because I don't really see trails of ants. You remember, I don't know, I haven't seen them in a long time. You know, a trail of ants going along. I haven't seen them around here, and that's a good thing because used to, the ants had a field out here. Now, the ants, they don't have opinions. The ants don't pick sides. The ants are all doing one thing. They're all doing the right thing, and they're all they're doing is they're getting the food, and they're taking the food back to the hive, and then they'll worry about who needs to eat. Ants. We're not ants, we are independent, we are free thinkers, but the ants really used to love Tropical Sands Christian Church because on the shelf, somewhere in the back of the shelf, was this, was this hardened, leaking bag of sugar, and on this hardened and leaking bag of sugar, it said youth. The youth don't drink a lot of coffee, therefore, the youth sugar was pretty full. 
And then beside that, there was another one that was that was tattered and ragged, and it was spilling sugar out. The ants were getting some of that sugar too, and it said C M F because this is the men's sugar, and don't touch the men's sugar, lady. This is our sugar. And then beside that was another bag of sugar. And so, so you're, you're sitting there, you're sitting there, you got about two pounds of sugars in three one-pound bags. A little more than that. But now this one says C-W-F. And you got three bags of sugar. And we bought this sugar, and you bought that sugar, and that's your sugar, and, and gentlemen, you, you nasty up your sugar, so we don't want your sugar. We don't want you touching our sugar, because ours is clean sugar. <coughs> Ants love this place. Finally, we stopped doing that. Thank God. Thank God. We finally started saying, sugar is sugar. Put it in Tupperware and put it aside. And whoever needs it, go ahead and use it. We still tend to build up leftovers in the refrigerator with names on it and everything. But eventually, we just kind of say, serve it, toss it, eat it, throw it away. Do something with it. I can imagine the church at Corinth. The church at Corinth, Paul talked about how they did communion. They had their fellowship meal. At one time it was a big fellowship meal. They said that the people who the people who didn't have jobs or the people who didn't have to work or who had good transportation, they would show up first and they would eat their fill and they would be drunk and gluttoned out before the poor people ever got there and they wouldn't get anything. Every man for himself. That's not the way it's supposed to be in the church. I thank God that it's less that way here. It's pretty much not that way here. But you can't help but pick sides once in a while. I love the cartoon I saw one time where a gentleman is uh, is is doing is helping people into the church and, and showing them their seats. The usher, the one of the deacons is serving as usher, and he says to the new couple visiting, he says, Well, where would you like to seat? In clapping or non-clapping? <laughs> Do you want to sit on the hallelujah side or do you want to be on the silent side? Do you want to come to the contemporary service or do you want to wait for the traditional service? Do you want to stand up a lot or do you want to stay seated? Different ways to worship, nothing wrong with it, until you find yourself talking about those people. Those people who do that versus these people who do this. Those people who came into our church versus us who were already here. Those people. I love the way this goes. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. Varieties of services, but the same Lord. Varieties of activities, but the same God. I had a friend here who was a very loyal member of the church, and uh, he was actually been a member of the church for about a year or so. We start looking at your leadership potential, and you may be given a job in training. You may be asked to serve as a deacon or some other service, and this gentleman was asked to serve as a deacon. He saw that as a great honor to be asked, and he didn't want any honors. He said, no, I don't want to be a deacon, but you can fix my name tag, put my title on it. I said, well, what is your title? He said, dishwasher. And so we made him a name tag that said dishwasher. And he took great pride in the fact that he was a dishwasher. He loved washing dishes, and he did very good at it. And, and, and it turns out, of course, that because he was one of very few people that really loves washing dishes, that we were all very appreciative of his services. There are a variety of services, but the same Lord. A variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. A variety of activities, but the same God, who activates all of them. Now listen to this. All of them in every one. You can break that down. In every one. Now you might think, say, well, if it's activated, then the Lord has activated it. No, that's not what it says, because then it goes on, to each is given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To each, that's each individual. That's 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 <coughs> taking them off one at a time. And it takes off every one of them. And each does not skip anybody. Each one has a gift. The, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. We might not know what it is. It might not be the, the, the service that's needed this particular day. It might be needed some other day. It might be something that's not a service that everyone doesn't see, that that service is your ability to welcome a certain type of people or your ability to get along with a certain type of process. We have accountants. We have, and it always, it always used to kill me. People would talk about the pastor or the musicians 
as if they were just God's gift to, to you know, which as I guess we are. But so are the accountants and the plumbers and the janitors. So are they. You think that's not true? You fire the janitor and see what happens. I guarantee you, you'll get along without a preacher longer, a lot longer than you'll get along without a janitor. Varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. Varieties of services, but the same Lord. Variety of activities, but the same God, who activates all of them and everyone. To each is given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Now, the truth of the matter is, most of this letter, and certainly almost all of chapter 12, is addressing this situation in the church of Corinth. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray by idols who could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Well, if you can say that, then you've got the Holy Spirit. Wrong with me to say you don't. He goes on with our, our scripture today and then picks up, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all are members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews are Greeks, slave or free. We were made to drink of one spirit. The body does not consist of any one member, but of many. If the foot were to say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, then it could not make any that less part of the body. And if the ear were to say, because I'm not the eye, I do not belong to the body, then that would not make it less a part of the body. I wonder who Paul's talking to here. Because listen to how that's said. Because the foot says to the hand, because I'm not a hand. Because the, the janitor says to the pastor, because the congregant says to the worship leader, because I'm not a musician, I'm not a part of the body of Christ, because I'm not a preacher, because I'm not a deacon or an elder or a leader, because I'm not a Sunday school teacher, I'm really, I'm just here watching, I'm just along for the ride, I'm just here to observe. Because I'm not what you are, I must not be a part of the body of Christ. <coughs> Paul goes on to say that sometimes the least significant parts are treated with the most honor because they're actually the most important. I will never forget the story of a woman who was being who who was riding down the road and just and she had been living a uh, she'd been living a, a, a sinful life and suddenly realized that she had to she had to receive Jesus she had to receive forgiveness she had to be saved. And so she stopped at, the, at, a, at a church. She saw the steeple. She saw the cross. She knew this is a church. She knew that she had to be saved, and she knew that she would uh, that, that she would find what she needed there. And so she burst in. And where is the pastor? The pastor's not here. Well, I need Jesus. And the first person that met her knelt with her and prayed with her and brought her to Jesus Christ, and that was the janitor. <coughs> He was called at that time. I love the story in the book of Acts where the apostles get all high and mighty, and I'm sorry, this is just the way I see it, and that tells you something about me, more about me than about the scripture or about the apostles. But there's that time where the, the Hellenized Jews and the and the, the, the Hebrew Christians and the and the Gentile Christians are are they're they're fighting about which widow should get the food first and who's gonna Who's going to do the meals on wheels this week and that kind of stuff? And Peter says, it's not right that we should spend our time waiting tables. So pick among yourselves some people to take care of that and let them take care of it. And they picked up, they picked some very good people uh, who could take care of the widows. But among them, they picked Stephen. Stephen, you may remember, is considered the first Christian martyr. Stephen was challenged. Stephen, they said, was a man that's close to God. He ended up doing miracles. He ended up being challenged by the Jewish authorities. Uh, uh, and Paul was there during that challenge. Paul held their coats while they stoned Stephen to death. Stephen gave one of the most stirring testimonies of God. Most, most the, 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 he connected the Old Testament from from Abraham, through David, through the present day, all the way to Jesus Christ. He argued convincingly that the, that the Jewish people were, they thought he was blaspheming, but he demonstrated that he knew the Bible as well as anybody there, and that he understood the scripture, and he used them to point to Jesus Christ, and when he got there, they plugged their ears, they said, we can't hear anymore, and they followed him, and they stoned him. And it said that Paul, Saul at the time, 
was holding their coats and consenting to that. Now, that was a man who was, like Peter said, well, we can't be bothered with that waiting tables. Well, Stephen could be bothered with waiting tables. Stephen accepted the call that he received. And by accepting the call that he received, by applying the talent that was needed, that he happened to have, by being a dishwasher at a critical time, he was placed in a position to answer the Spirit's call when God called him to die for the faith, when God called him to testify to the highest officials in the temple. That was Stephen. Each of us has a gift. Each of us is called. Each to each is given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. You know, it's a shame that in our in, in our particular breed of Christianity, because of this whole democracy thing, and uh, and, and coupled with the twenty-four hour news cycle and the instant polling and all of the uh, all of the social media that we're into, and I. I'm as bad as anybody about this. We end up developing sides and picking sides and deciding what we're going to do and, and watching the debate. And everything is point counterpoint, and there's never there's never two sides. There's never less than two sides to the story. And it doesn't matter how ridiculous one position is, they're going to get the opposite position and give them equal time because that seems like somebody's version of fair. And in the church, we tend to do the same thing. We take a vote. We we take a poll, we figure out, is this, is this what everybody wants to do? And you, that's not how the church works. You know, when you want to build a ramp, say you want to build a wheelchair ramp, you don't stop and say, wait a minute, how many wheelchairs do we have in this church? You know, you say, do we have even one? Will we ever have one? Do we ever hope to have one? If so, you build a ramp, even though 99% of us don't need a ramp. When it comes to putting up handrails, we don't say, well, gee, how many members of the choir really need a handrail? I don't answer that. I'm not going to bother. I'm not going to go there. Nevertheless, we put the rail up because if there's even one, if there's even one, then that's a reason to do it. If there's even one wheelchair, that's a good reason to have a ramp. If there's even one child, that's a good reason to have a nursery. If there's even one adult that wants to study the Bible, that's one reason enough to have a Bible study. If there's even one, there's a variety of gifts. It's the same spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. There's a variety of services, but the same Lord. We're doing it all to serve Jesus Christ. We're doing it all to lift high the name of Jesus Christ, to, to keep the house of Jesus open, to keep the ministries of Jesus going both the important ministries and the unimportant ministries, both the well-supported and the not-so-well-supported, both the rich ministries and the ones that don't bring a dime in here. We get, what do we get on Sunday school? About a dollar? One dollar in Sunday school? I wonder what we got this morning. doesn't matter because we're not doing it for money. We're doing it for ministry. There's a variety of services, but the same Lord. A variety of activities there are. We have a folk service. Contemporary service, traditional service, off-schedule rock and roll service, a recovery service, a youth service. There are all of these different services, but they all serve to bring people to Jesus Christ. They all serve to strengthen the church. The hand cannot say, the foot cannot say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the church. By the same token, the kids can't say, because we're not the adults, we don't belong to the church. The recovery crowd can't say because we're not we're not uh, wearing a suit we don't belong to the church. Nobody can say I don't belong. See, that's the thing you said. He said because the foot is not a hand, the foot can't say I don't belong. You can't say I don't belong because you do, and you can't say I'm ungifted because we're told that you have a gift, and you, if you if you don't see it, if you don't know what it is, it doesn't matter because there's a variety of gifts. There are a variety of services. There are a variety of activities. All you have to do is stay in there, hang in there. You know, it's such a shame. We, we've reached the point where not only do we vote, or not, not the church, but in society in general, not only is everything boiled down to a vote and everything boils down to a side of either A or B, black and white, this side or that side, but it's all a very close vote. It's always 49-51. It's always 49.6. You know, 50.4, whatever it happens to be. I mean, it's, 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 it's all very close. I've always said the God of the victory is the God of the margin. 
The God who wants a particular person to win, obviously doesn't want that person to win by a lot. Wants that person to know that they came this close to losing. Wants that person to stay humble and to know that not everyone agrees with them. The God of the victory is the God of the margin. The God of your gift is the God of my gift. The God of this service is the God of the evening service or the Saturday service or the early service. One Lord. One Lord. So, I do urge you to be engaged, to let people know how you feel, to, to, to state your opinion, to, to make your vote, but when the vote is made, when the decision is made, then it becomes time to close ranks. It becomes time to close ranks. You know, um, there are people that, um, you know, it seems like we elect a leader and then we spend the rest of the time trashing that leader. And I'll, and I'll and I'm sure you, the, 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 I mean, and I'm sure everyone can say this because if you look at the way the pendulum has been swinging during our lifetimes, I presume most of us are about my age. During our lifetimes, you know the way the pendulum is swung, and I know that every one of you can say, well, sometimes, sometimes the person that I support wins, and sometimes the person that I support doesn't win. And the test of character is how do I treat the other side when my man wins? And how do I treat, how, how loyal am I to the leader, to the organization, to the nation, to the church when my side loses? We all have gifts, and we're all important. Everyone matters. Don't close those doors on anybody. Don't send anyone out there. Try to do, I mean, I'm, I'm trying an exercise. Anytime I say, well, they, anytime I catch myself saying, they are those people, I stop and say, we. Every time I catch myself saying, I don't know why they, I start saying, I wonder what I can do to make this better. What can I do to make these people feel more welcome? What can I do to make them feel like somebody's on their side? What can I do? to make them feel like this is their church. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, may we receive that Spirit as intended for the common good. Amen.